it is my very great pleasure to introduce Mr. Ted Lair, who is the data architect with the city of Austin. Um, he is going to speak to us about how to reduce commute times and improve quality of life in the city with IoT and 5G technologies as a resident of Austin. I am really looking forward to what you have to say. So please call on up, um, and I'll queue up your presentation as you get ready. I'll just, I'll just step on this side and queue this up for you. Yeah, so the, um, the previous speaker, uh, Joseph's uh, comments will resonate when I start speaking in terms of the impact of IoT on a community. And the notion, the thing I'm going to be emphasizing is the, a need for a community when IoT is being deployed to be able to experiment with that IoT and how does government help facilitate that. So um, again, I, my name is Ted Lair. I'm a data architect for the city of Austin. And um, the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about for whom we're doing this for. And 15, 15. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Uh, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Discussion, I'll discuss the 5G claim, which is one I think is uh, very close to uh, sort of the excitement that was generated by the previous speaker. And then, what does it mean to have a city as a 5G platform? So Mayor Adler uh, has said that, the, uh, that um, when we start doing smartness, and well, let's say put part smartness in quotes, what communities are we looking at? Are we trying to make our airport a George Jetson kind of place? Are we trying to go to have the folks who are already uh, benefiting from smartness, so to speak, uh, have them impacted. But the idea in Austin is that we want this to first address the needs of our most challenged or vulnerable communities. So I want you to think about it. We're not putting in necessarily smartness to make life better for the folks who have it great, who have it easy now, so to speak. We're trying to do, see what we can use this uh, to help the more, more vulnerable communities. So here's a 5G prediction that I like very much, and I say I quote him respectfully, even though I'm going to poke fun at this prediction in just a moment. So move that mouse. So this says something about as soon as we get pedestrians with 5G-enabled phones and we get cars with 5G in it, um, they will be able to, because of the latency and the speeds of all 5G, these cars will detect a pedestrian walking into the street, and the car will come to a full stop, and the pedestrians will be safe. And so he's predicting in 20 years, uh, pedestrian injuries, in, in, injuries will be a thing of the past. So of course, I ask rhetorically, what could go wrong? Right? What could go wrong? So what happens to a system, you're my headline, when its participants do and get what they like, walking across the street, while being unaccountable or irresponsible? We get the internet, right? Now that's a bad joke. And I don't mean to be like a technology uh, flat earther on this, but a, co a common thing that uh, the traffic departments around the world have assumed for the last hundred years or so is that people are afraid or, 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 or hesitate walking into a street because they think they might get run over. So if this technology is really going to be out there, and I'm not saying that this is going to happen, but this is the kind of thing a city has to explore. What happens if you're not going to get hit if you have these technologies? Are we going to have a bunch of folks walking willy-nilly across our streets? Do we have to plan for that? Do we have to think about that? Um, are we going to have jaywalking at times that we don't really want to have jaywalking? Are we going to have it increase? Are we, are we going to be able to want to detect that? We will be able to detect that. Will we, will we be invading somebody's privacy? We'll still have the same laws against it. Will we have to detect it? Will we see an increase in it? You know, I was a teenager. We all were teenagers did crazy things. I mean, you play games of chicken, right? Lying in the street. Well, I got a 5G phone. I'm going to lie in the street. And nobody's going to hit me. Or I got a 5G car. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tech guru. I'm going to turn that 5G off and I'm going drive, drive down the middle of the street. I'm not saying those are going to happen in large numbers that shut down our systems, but those things can happen. And to the extent we have to think about what our technologies do, when we make statements about we're going to save lives, we also have to think about what kind of things people do when suddenly their responsibility or accountability may go away. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'm not even sure about this, but one thing I've noticed, and this is an anecdote, the thing I've noticed in the past, um, I'll say year, is that when I'm driving on the highway, some folks will be merging, and their merging distance is very close now. 
I'm just, just no, I didn't pick this up to happen this morning. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Well, more and more cars have these blind spot detectors, right? And what they do is you're looking in your blind spot detector and it's saying, oh, there's no car in my blind spot. Well, that means the car might be six inches or more behind my vehicle. <laughs> Move right in front of you. So that blind spot detector thing was supposed to help improve safety, and I'm sure it does. But it may be an enabling behavior that right now is not quite what we want. So these are uninten unintended consequences. And I'm, I'm speculating here. I mean, I don't have proof of this, but this is just Ted, the, the paranoid guy, thinking that maybe with this blind spot detectors, folks are being more reckless or more assertive on the roadway, right? So given that a city has to think about these kinds of things, and we all should think about these things, the technologists who talk about how much safer work should be should also think about all the anomalies that might be introduced in it and providing solutions for that rather than, let's say, the city says, we're just going to make sure everybody's phone is monitored and we'll catch you doing these bad things. I mean, that's not going to go very well. Um, so what are we trying to do? Back to com improving commutes, because now I've said, well, now that we're going to have everybody jaywalking, the commute times go to heck, right? <laughs> um, so what, is a, what are we trying to optimize for in a transportation department? I, I'm not in the transportation department for the city of Austin, but I've advised them on the USDOT transportation grant. Am I doing okay in time? Great. Okay. okay. Um, so what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? What are we optimizing for? If we gave it to the private sector, they might optimize for stops at the businesses along the route, which is fine. I know that some cities are doing that. That's how they're paying for some of this. But if you're a transportation department, are you trying to maximize throughput? Is that throughput maximizing the number of vehicles moving down a corridor? Is it maximizing the number of occupants moving? You know, you have different solutions. Some of them may be, quote, smart and not so smart. If you want to maximize occupants, you might put a lot of folks in buses. If you want to maximize vehicle throughput, you put them in there, whatever, right? Or do you maximize response time, meaning the time it takes to get to your destination, right? What, is your, what are you trying to do with this smartness? And sometimes they're not the same thing. Roughly, if you know of Little's Law, for those who do queuing theory and that kind of thing, um, the marine response time, meaning how quickly you get somewhere, is roughly proportional, inversely proportional to the throughput. So the more stuff you got going into your system, the lower your response time, the slower you get there. That's kind of intuitive, but there's some actual formulas for all this kind of thing. So what is the city going to do here? Allow you to get a good response time? Well, maybe we'll give you that toll lane, or maybe we'll give you special 5G capacity to go somehow faster, and everybody else who hasn't bought into that program will let them go slower, but we'll have high throughput, and for the right people, we'll get their good response time. What's the solution to that? There's technology enables us to think about this, but cities have to decide. And there's, no, and there's going to be no agreement community-wide on what the right answer is, and that's a city's job, just to, to make a decision and not have everybody agree with it. Um, and safety. So are we trying to minimize total, numbers of, total number of injuries? You probably have heard this now. This is a very popular thing to read about in the news. When you're buying your car, you're buying it to be, you know, and I, you know I, I'm always bought, I try to buy the latest technology when I'm buying a new car that looks at safety. I look at safety records, I look at crash results, I look at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, I look at all of that kind of stuff. Because I want to protect my occupants, I want to protect me, right? When I have an accident, I want to protect myself. Well, if you're a city, if you're a government, and you're responsible for the costs of servicing injuries, you know, helping injuries, you might be thinking, well, let's reduce the total number of injuries. So it was up to the city, you might say, well, I'm going to put technology in that car not to, you know, optimize the safety of the occupant, but to minimize the total number of injuries in an accident. So for example, let's say, and this, uh, that's a very hypothetical, but it's a good illustration, you have a, a self-driving vehicle that needs to, it's going to collide with something, and it has, your, has a grandmother, it has two little kids, and it has a big oak tree, okay? If it's optimizing for the safety of the passengers, it's not going to hit the big oak tree. It's going to hit the grandmother or the two little kids, right? And if it was up to the city to decide who they hit, well, maybe pick the grandmother because you got the two little kids, right? You know? So those are maybe obscene analogies, but those are questions that have to be addressed. And you can just go search, search on Google for the ethics of self-driving car or accident avoidance and that kind of thing. What is the city's job? What are we optimizing for? And if you do a survey, you know, if the, I put a hyperlink in the, in the presentation, 
most folks, when they talk about buying cars, I'm protecting me. Uh, the heck with, you know, everybody else. I mean, not the heck, but, you know, I'm protecting me. And so um, that prioritization is an interesting piece. Now, that little picture I show you is an interesting technology that um, I forget where I got it from. It's a patent. It comes out of Google where it's, a, it's an airbag for the pedestrian. So the car not only has airbags for the occupants, but if it knows it's going to hit a pedestrian, well, golly, I chose the pedestrian over the tree. Maybe the federal government sometime in the distant future says, well, okay, thank you. Okay, okay, I'm going to have you not only have you know, airbags that protect all the, pedest all, all the occupants, but you're going to have to have airbags on the exterior of your car if you're going to hit a pedestrian because the car is going to know you're going to hit a pedestrian. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But these are the things when we talk about these technologies that cities and other governments are thinking about. And reacting or responding or anticipating or, or getting ahead of this is not being, like some folks would be saying about what we did with Lyft and Uber, trying to shut down technology and be a flat earther on these kind of things. It's trying to be responsible what of the unintended consequences of what technology will bring us. So back to quality of life. What are we optimizing for with this? Well, Mary Adler would say we want to, we all, often you hear folks about what problems are we solving? Well, what opportunities are we creating? Can we strengthen our communities with this technology? Can we create, uh, can we improve affordability or desirability? Can we keep the neighborhoods together? Is that important to keep the neighborhoods together? Is that a goal for smartness? Every, we're talking about safety and transportation. Is keeping a neighborhood together something we can do better with, trans, with, with smartness, right? Um, or increasing, increasing or facilitating social participation or political participation. Those are discussions. I don't know, I'm not proposing an answer, but those are certainly discussions. Or increasing opportunity. Do we want to have uh, employers, connecting employers to communities? Can we do that with a smart technology? Or connecting the residents to the better jobs? These are things, these are real problems now that we want to address. This, I don't want to call them simple. The more obvious ones about transportation safety, maybe health outcomes are are ones we can address, but these are the ones that we want to think about. If you, can, if you knew of a problem like this, this is my, my point to you, you folks, and this is what I tell folks in the city. If you have this problem, have these goals, what, you want, what we ask you to do is what data do you need to help understand the problem, and then maybe after you understand it, what additional data do you need to help fix the problem? If you can define the data you need for this, for those two things, understanding and fixing it, what kind of sensors or what type of technology, what kind of smart technology do we want to add that helps us get that data so we can actually go down those paths of understanding and solving for these problems? And then, of course, we have ideas of, of improving services like healthcare, ed education, and mobility. I've got, probably got a minute now, right? Okay. And so what are we going to do? Well, there's a NSF grant. You know, the U.S. Uh, Austin lost to Columbus. Um, we were a close second. In fact, we probably should have won. I know we should have won, but you know, Columbus got it. Uh, for the U.S. Department of Transportation grant, but now there's another one coming out for 5G, 5G and IoT. The NSF, there's a power program. I'd look this up. Um, the idea is there's $100 million spread on four cities. After that, those four cities will become a platform for 5G research, and the goal of this is to take that research and commercialize it. You know, we, the, the, United, the NSF wants to have the United States lead on 5G because, maybe not because, but partly because, Europe led on 4G. And the NSF would like the United States to be the 5G leader. So Austin's going to be applying for this thing, and we have to figure out what it means to be a platform. And we're looking for university and industry partners to help us make that application. We think we have a strong basis in our USDOT proposal. We think we have the right attitude about how we want to experiment and what we, how we want to do with our community. But this is what we're pursuing, and this is the idea that maybe I haven't told you how to improve commutes, and I haven't told you how to improve quality of life. But what I'm telling you is what Austin wants to be able to do so it can experiment and run the experiments to achieve those goals. And so if you're interested in doing that, it's my outreach to you, um, there's two folks you can contact. You can contact me. And there's also uh, a gentleman, uh, Tom Balmonte, from the North Central Texas Council of Governments. He's helping coordinate. It's going to be a Texas-wide thing. We're hoping that Austin is the hub and Texas becomes the 5G research capital of the world. That's ambitious, but then it wouldn't be Austin if we didn't have ambition, right? So that's it. I think I'm just over, right? We have 15, so we've got some time. You said 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs>
stretch. Well, this is this is my last slide, so <laughs> I, I could have slowed I could have slowed down a little bit there. Um, um, so let me back it up and let's see if there's something I can talk about here. Yeah, I, I'm, enter I'm more than happy to entertain questions. You know, some of the things that we've, uh, you know, when we talk about affordability, you know, when we start putting smartness into a neighborhood um, or any technologies, we're improving the neighborhood. If we do what Mayor Adler asks us to do, well, what are we going to do? We're going to make that neighborhood probably more desirable. If it's more desirable, it's probably less affordable. If it's, you know, property taxes go up. If it's less affordable, the communities that are living there may be driven out. So we have that problem to address. This is not necessarily a technology problem, but it's a problem that we want to address as a city. We have all these great things we do, but in the end, if the people who benefit are the folks who are already well off and well positioned, we've done something wrong. Okay. Yes, sir? Um, I'm Kevin Tagger from Arthur de Little. We've been uh, working a lot with uh, smart, smart city and cities. And the difference between, let's say, Middle East cities, whether it's uh, Doha, Dubai, all the names you always hear, where we've been working with, and Vienna, where I'm coming from, as well as Stockholm, the approach is totally different. Uh, in the Middle East, it's more top-down. There is a ruler, basically, who has a vision and just imposed. And he no nominates uh, a minister of uh, happiness, and there are some KPIs and the whole... Let's yeah, say, we don't have that here. <laughs> <laughs> in Austria and in Stockholm, it's really very much bottom-up. So it's about inclusion. Exactly what you said, and mm -hmm. inclusion in, with respect to social, let's say, uh, uh, classes up to uh, income, up to age, etc. And they don't care about uh, basically the, the digitalized people, they care about the ones who do not have access to digital transformation mm -hmm. in general. Uh, so the approach in Austria, in Jena and in Stockholm is very much um, based on open platform where basically all the questions you put there are dealt with in the community. And this is br broken down to a very small, not district, even a street. The street decides whether, at the end of the day, they convert themselves as a pedestrian zone, create among the retailer community, solve that problem, rather than you know, a big picture of a city. So how do you engage with um, uh, the population in general, and how do you take the decision based on that? that, that that's a great question, and don't take my answer as the final one. It, I think you should take it as an opinion. Because like those European cities, we, have, it's, we don't have an autocrat. <laughs> we have a discussion. Uh, I'd like to, uh, before I finish, really start the answer, I want to make sure you understand there's a difference between Austin's city government and, let's say, Chicago, New York. Um, there's a notion of a strong mayor and a weak mayor system. And Austin has a notion of a weak mayor system. You can think of Austin's mayor system. You can think of Chicago, where Rahm Emanuel is, um, as being a system where he could probably, if I were working there, it's possible for him to fire me, okay? The mayor can't fire me, okay? I'm a city staff member. So in Austin, the mayor and city council are like the board of directors and the chairman of the board. So the mayor is the chairman of the board and the city council is the board of directors. They set strategy, policy, you know, big picture stuff. And then they say, we want to have this, we, want, we vote for, you know, bond issues. And then the executive management is like the president and the CEO, they operate the city. So we have a separation there. But in places like Chicago, you have a closer bi you know, binding of the politics with actual the operations of the city. So Austin is a, has a weak mayor system. So there's this, the process of doing that is a lot of civic engagement. How do you do that? Well, I work with colleagues who want to go out and do surveys, have meetups, do a lot of engagement with the community the old fashioned way. And the old fashioned way sounds expensive and sounds slow, but it's very effective. I just attended a meeting last night at UT about job, job placement. For some of our communities, they, it's not that they don't trust. They don't know or just don't, they don't use the technology. They don't understand how the technologies can help them get a better job or better education. But if they're told by people they trust in the old-fashioned way, they use it, right? It's a hybrid thing. So, but if you're up to me, you know, we have folks saying, like, I want to put out kiosks. And what I'd like to do is suspend our ordinances. We have an ordinance, a sign ordinance that written in 1984. If you, look, if you go out here and look at the pet, out that door, look at the downtown Austin, you won't see a whole lot of billboards, very few billboards, hardly any. You go to the highways, we have them. But it's a clean-looking clean city. That's because of a sign ordinance written in around 1982, 84. 
And basically it says you can't have off-premise advertising signs, that, especially that face the roadway. Okay? Well, in 1984, I, I don't know it was 82, we didn't know about the internet. We didn't have search engines. We didn't have wayfinding. We didn't have browsers. We didn't have social media. We didn't have, you name it. Yet we're using, we have to, our planning and zoning department says we have to, I'm going to be answering your question, Desi, but we have to use that, that advertising ordinance, that sign ordinance, to govern this new technology. So how do we do that, in, embrace the community? That's going to be a one or two year process, in my opinion. But how can we get better information about en engaging the community? Well, one way I pr I've proposed, and we're looking into it, is to spend our ordinances in an experimental fashion. So let's select a corridor in the city. And I think Dallas or Fort Worth has done something like this, and some cities around the country do. Let's suspend our ordinances. Let's choose a corridor and say, we're going to suspend the ordinance for a year. We're going to put in some of this crazy new stuff. We're going to have the private sector assume the risk. Because if the private sector wants to come in and do this fast, they have to, you know, they, what they get is quickness of decision, but they have to s assume some of the risk if somebody trips over some device or something that they're, that's their fault, right? So we suspend that sign ordinance. We get the feedback from the public whether they like, for example, smart kiosks or they like the beacons or they like whatever we're putting out there, the cameras. You know, we get that out there. We get that feed up. That feedback then is used to help influence what we do to update our sign ordinances. But what happens then, that kind of thing risks upsetting the public. If we put something out there that in the traditional ways that we go and we do surveys and surveys and surveys and we get, and you can say, I don't, I don't like this too much, but it's very engaging. It's a very old fashioned, touchy way of engaging the citizenry. But we try to do something that's not gonna upset too many people and that's gonna take time. My preference, my recommendation, and I'm not the decision maker in this, my recommendation is let's do some experiments and have a plan for handling upset residents. We're not gonna hurt anybody, you know, physically or financially, ideally. But let's, you know, let's have a plan to handle that kind of feedback. I think that's the better way. It's the faster way. Um, it's better than surveys because a lot of times you give somebody a survey and they don't know what you're talking about and the survey really isn't that valuable. Yes, sir? Thank you. Do we need a mic for the questions or not? I can hear you perfectly. I being recorded, <laughs> they are yeah. But I can repeat your question. So long as you repeat them. All right, so um, you showed an interesting example about how the uh, city can set the goals and the goals can be, you know, the number of cars that flow, the number of people that flow, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that was really interesting, and I agree in concept, but historically, the governments have been the impediment, of, and I'm not anti-government, I'm saying, when we look at regulations... Uh, uh, next question. <laughs> no, wait, so looking at the car, I'm talking transport, uh, the, the regulations say you have to have rear view mirrors. So the car makers say, you know, we can do much better things with cameras, that are more aerodynamic and save on fuel, and yet the regulations themselves are limiting uh, the, the ability to innovate. And so you described a case where we could set the goal, the objectives perfectly, but the problem is they get cast in stone. So how do you, um, you know, avoid legislating mirrors and move towards what you're talking about, where the outcomes of what is legislated? I have three minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> um, but Frank, I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I can tell you what, as a staff member, what I encourage folks to do is that we, as staff, want to be efficient on this. Um, well, they're, they're recording it, so I'm just saying, let's say you... you, you I'll, I'll simplify the question. Okay. So, so how, if you, we get back to your example, which will simplify it. If we're talking about what is the objective in traffic flow, is it, how do you make sure that the, what the choice you make is future-proof? Well, you don't set it in stone, and what we, what I argue for, is that we allow ourselves to iterate and to learn. So, if maybe here, I don't want to pick a buzzword, but agile kind of notion. Um, if we set it in stone, then um, you mean you, know, you can review these things. I'd like to see experiments, and we get feedback from the experiments. And you, you have to have a rule that you can protect the public on. And my view is, you know the. I mean, it's a Jeffersonian kind of thing, if I think of Jefferson, but you know, your government's idea that the goal of government is not necessarily to be efficient. Maybe a company is efficient and profitable, but an efficient government is a dangerous government, right? So, okay, there, was that a bad answer? <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> yeah, I saw another hand going up. I'm almost done. That wasn't too bad. I took 20 minutes and stretched it into whatever. Yes, sir? Where do you think Austin is going to be in 
I don't want to be flipped, but I don't think my answer would means a whole lot to that. I think um, we have companies that are putting it in, and I was hoping Rondella was in here. Um, I really can't tell you. I don't think my answer would be meaningful. I, I know that we have a lot of folks working toward um, those goals, but I, I'm not. I, if I say something, it's going to be worth as much as uh, I know somebody in the back said, saying something. No, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you.